Hello, XJW Bible Bites, Thaddeus here. Well, we are considering today 1 Samuel 17, uh, Treasures Part. Uh, we'll get right into it. We'll start with a reading of verse 1 of 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Danim between Soko and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah, and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another, with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of mail of bronze weighing five thousand shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed six hundred shekels. His shield-bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man to have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So it was not long ago that the Philistines had been beaten and driven before the armies of Israel. They would have been totally routed and crushed if Saul's rashness had not prevented this from happening. But here the Philistines have gathered their forces together again. And this time the army has one of the rulers of Gath with them, a champion named Goliath. The enemies of the body of Christ are always watchful, and they take all advantages whenever they possibly can. But they never have a greater advantage than when believers provoke God's Spirit to leave, and when they force the prophets to leave them. God's people are protected from attacks by the Spirit of God and the covenant enforcers, the prophets. He will never abandon us, but we can cause that protection to leave through our own choices. In verse 16, we see this giant, who is a Rephite, uh, has been taunting Israel for 40 days. The 40 days number interested me. That's something I always missed before. Uh, 40 is a significant number in the Bible. Uh, the reign of the great deluge lasted for 40 days. Moses fasted for 40 days. Moses was atop Mount Sinai for 40 days. Elijah took 40 days to walk to Horeb. Jesus, when he was led into the wilderness to be tempted, <clears throat> fasted for 40 days, and he was on the earth for 40 days until he was taken back to heaven. Um, on a final interesting note, the human gestation period is about 40 weeks. So 40 in the Bible is associated with repentance, newness, preparation, important work, self-examination, transformation, Fulfillment, escape from bondage or slavery, nourishment and growth, uh, not just material but spiritual, personal fulfillment, redemption and salvation, and ultimately, new generation and new life. So at the end of this 40-day time period, we see David come into the account. So this has been 40 days of this Rephite abomination taunting the battle lines of Israel. I'll pick up the reading in verse 28. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and said, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down to only watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? Then he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. 
So here we see David's brother, who's probably stressed out about the situation and feeling insecure, assume ill of David. That's something we often do with people around us. Uh, Eliab, who is the eldest brother, gave voice to his misgivings about his younger brother. Maybe a seed of jealousy was in him because David, the youngest, had been anointed over him. Uh, but David's anointing meant blessing for their entire household, not just David. So it should have been a happy thing. Plus, David was coming that day with gifts to refresh his brothers. In verse 31, we read, What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. Now remember, Saul already knew of David. David had already begun serving as a musician in the court. Continuing the reading, David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Oh, the translations of different manuscripts and the interpretations of the measurements given vary Goliath wildly in size from what would be tiny for a Rephite of just under 7 feet to about medium at around over 11 feet. So it's hard to say precisely how large he was, especially since his supposed burial site and where David either buried or hid his skull are not allowed to be excavated by the government authorities in that area to see. But he was a champion, and he was much larger than a normal man. Um, in my research, the Rephites are not even technically human. Continuing in verse 34, But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear rescued me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. That was interesting, the specific mention of Goliath being uncircumcised. Uh, in ancient texts around Baal and the Rephites and such, Baal despised circumcision and said it was an abomination to, uh, how was it put, to corrupt or to mutilate the male member. Whereas circumcision for the Israelites was a symbol of the covenant that they had with God. It was to set them apart from the nations around them. And such powerful covenants are sealed with blood, which is what would have happened when the foreskin was cut off, is that covenant would have been sealed with blood. And God did give the specific instructions this was not to be done in the baby's life until their vitamin K was at the highest that it actually ever is to prevent them from having undue suffering. I thought it was interesting that this was mentioned of the Philistines specifically. Uh, but one has to wonder why Elihab and not Saul went out against Goliath. And they could have asked for the Lord to be with them. David had been being trained and having experiences built up for him to this event, from his uh, herding the sheep and being in the wilderness. Uh, one preacher I actually remember listening to commented a theory that Samuel either had or would end up training David with the sword. Um, according to his reading, when Samuel cut apart the Amalekite king Agag, the implication of the language there was with skill and not with wild hacking, more like as when one prepares an animal. I thought that was an interesting note. In verse 38, we read, Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic, or more accurately, armor from his own armory. He put a coat of mail on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go on these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in hand, approached the Philistine. We see here that the men wanted to outfit David in standard battle gear. 
I think there's an important lesson here. These men were still thinking in the natural, in the material. We see Goliath's spear is described as a weaver's beam, so much larger than the spear of an ordinary man with an iron tip that is either valued at 300 shekels, because some translators say the shekels amount is the value, not the weight, and others say it is the weight, or both, but that would have been about 18 pounds of iron or steel. That's heavy. Um, what did they think would happen if David, a young man who's slowed down by armor, is hit by this 30-pound pole arm when you factor in the head, the shaft, and the counterweight? The energy of the blow could still kill him, even if the iron blade didn't cut through the bronze mail. You don't need a sharp weapon to kill. A blunt sword or axe can just as easily mortally wound through armor, especially in strikes to the head. So these men were not exercising good sense, but David knew better. But we also see David selected five stones. Why did he pick five stones? Was his faith in having multiple projectiles, just in case he missed? Oh no, he picked up enough stones that he would have four more, representing Goliath's relatives. David, no doubt, knew that he would achieve victory through God. Goliath's relatives, you say? Where is that in the Bible? Well, it's here. Joshua 13, 2 through 5. This is the land... Or, yeah, this is the land that remains, all the regions of the Philistines and the Gesherites, from the Sihor River on the east of Egypt to the territory of Ekron on the north, all of it counted as Canaanite, or Phoenician, though held by five Philistine rulers in Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron, the territory of the Avites, on the south, all the land of the Canaanites, from Ara of the Sidonians as far as Aphek, and the border of the Amorites, the area of Byblos, and all of Lebanon to the east, from Baal Gad, below Mount Hermon, to Lebo Hamath. So we see five Philistine rulers in Gaza. 2 Samuel 21, 18-22 In the course of time, there was another battle with the Philistines at Galab. At that time, Sibachai, the Hushai, killed Saph, one of the descendants of Rapha, Raphaim. In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elhanan, son of Sher, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath the Gittite, who had a spear shaft like a weaver's rod. In another battle, which took place at Gath, there was a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in all. He also was descended from Rapha. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. These four were descendants of Rapha in Gath, and they fell at the hands of David and his men. They were Rephite, they were giants. So Goliath seemed like a mighty opponent, but he was slain through the will of God. In these accounts, we see that there were four more Rephite leaders. David took additional stones in the same number as these giants. Perhaps he wondered if the other giants would come after him or his family. Or perhaps it was symbolic, David knowing that God would see to it that all of these monsters were slain. David had been at the court of Saul already, seeming to alternate between his court duties and helping his family. But now, David was about to step out of obscurity and into the light, and it came with a much longer duel with a different kind of giant. David's battle with Goliath might be famous, but it was over in an instant. What seemed like a large obstacle turned out to really be a molehill. David's real battle would be a spiritual one with King Saul. So that's all I had for this treasures part today. Uh, the next treasures will be 1 Samuel 18, where David's real troubles and trials begin. I hope you all have a good night.